Because, let me begin here, because it's not enough. It's not enough for Bang & Olufsen that uh, the research uh, manager, he goes back to the top manager, was a different one back then when they looked at those Theovision 32. Now they have a, another young man there to try to move them on to the future. Um, but when the research director, with whom I've collaborated a lot, Sir Beck is his name, by the way, part-time professor also at Aalborg University. Um, Bang & Olsen has a lot of those uh, uh, mixed things, either some of, in this case, their own guy being 20% at the university, or they have actually university guys hired in for 15-20% uh, deals for the better of everyone, I believe. Uh, so they're pretty uh, good at involving themselves into research and trying to use that as a part of their strategy for surviving still, which we hope they do. It would be good for Denmark if they can get back and be the very strong and nice company that they used to be with some really nice products and expensive. It's not enough to go back and say, hey, hooray, I found out that the 12 different combinations of TVs and pictures that we tested this morning, they are not the same on the noise. Give me a raise. Hallelujah. It's not enough because what's the first question that comes after they're not the same? What would he ask? Which one should we use? Right? I'm, I'm just uh, exaggerating the obvious here a little bit, right? The F test is an overall test. It doesn't tell the full story. It just tells us statistically. Is there even some sense in going on to actually trying to find an optimal one or one that is uh, different from the others? Could we even go on from here? Yes. So if the F test becomes uh, clearly significant, we will face the fact that we need to post hoc investigate the various groups that we are facing. Now there is a little challenge here that we need for the ethics and for the proper stats thinking to, uh, to touch on here. Because let me uh, oh, exaggerate a little bit, sorry for those stupid ex exaggerated examples, but hopefully they make a point sometimes. Let's assume that you compared 100 groups, right? And um, hey, and you don't even care about the F statistics. You just, uh, I don't want to bother look at that F statistics. An F statistic comparing hundred things at the same time. I don't really want to look at that. Let me just go do all the uh, comparisons because that's what we are going to do. Funny enough, we go back to a kind of two-group comparison like the one that we talked about uh, quite some um, weeks ago. We do that post hoc now. So we do a two-group comparison, for instance, by, as a confidence interval, and you will have seen a formula much like this when we did a confidence interval in the two-group setting, right? But the difference now is there are two differences in this formula and approach to the one that we shared with you back then. One difference is this number, the variance number that we use for comparing group I and J. That variance is a variance computed across all the groups, right? That's the, all the groups averaged within group variability, what we take off from the ANOVA computation. So I use information about variability from all the groups when I compare group I and J, right? I don't only use the I and J data now for the comparison. I use the information from all the groups. And then accordingly, the degrees of freedom that goes with the t-statistic should be used accordingly, not n minus 2 or something complicated like we do, did in the two-sample case where we had some complicated formula for this Welsh-type uh, degrees of freedom thing. Um, this is much easier. We just use n minus k here that goes with this using all the groups information. However, now to the thing. We should be careful now. What if we studied 100 combinations at Bang & Olufsen and we just went on 
And did all, how many comparisons can we do? Because you can see when we have uh, 100, let's, let's go back to the 12 case. Let's just skip the stupid example and go back to the real life case with 12 combinations. How many pairwise I and J's can we make when we have 12 groups? Well, it's the upper triangle without the diagonal. It's 12 by 11 divided by 2 in this 12 by 12 box of possible comparisons with only the upper diagonal and without the diagonal. 12 by 11 divided by 2, that's 66 comparisons when you have 12 groups. How many significant results do we expect to get out of 66 comparisons? Even if we do something where nothing is going on. So I test the same pictures on the same TVs. I'm just doing a toy experiment to waste Bang & Olufsen's money. Um, I do a, a toy experiment with the same products, 12 uh, equal products, and then I do 66 pairwise comparisons at the end of the day. How many of those would I expect to come out significant even though I did this stupid experiment where nothing went on? How many out of the 66 would be expected to be significant? Yeah? 5% which is like 3, 4 kind of thing, right? 3 at least. 3.3 .3 on average. So I will always expand. And what would you think the chance that just one of them appears significant is pretty high, right? Much more than five. That's the thing. So we should be careful about this multiplicity, as it's called sometimes, or significance by chance that could occur when we start doing this. And this is particularly important when we start doing such a post hoc investigation, where we might start uh, comparing across many, many comparisons. We have to be careful. Because it would not be fair to pick out one by regular means and just say, now I'm sure I have a significance. We should uh, realize that we picked one out of 66 if we want to pick it out. I'm not saying we shouldn't look at it necessarily. Uh, but we should realize what we do. Or, this is the difficult part scientifically and ethically. If I knew from the beginning that I was going to compare TV1 with TV2. These are my two, I knew that before I made the experiment. These are my two real uh, choices for the further production. Then I threw in 10 others of the, from the, some of my competitors and others, uh, pro, sort of prototypes, old prototypes, just to benchmark against something I've tried previously and things like that. But I know I have two options based on all other development work we've done. There are two options left. I'm going to decide between uh, these two. So even though I do an experiment where I have 12 combinations, I know at the end of the day I'm going to focus on one and two. That's an important, that's so-called a pre-planned comparison. I knew in advance before I started looking at the data. There's a difference between deciding on which to compare. Or looking at the data and say, ah, I'd like to compare the smallest one with the largest one, right, after I see the data. That's, that's not right, right? However, sometimes, sometimes, and this is the new thing, sometimes you might just be in an explorative phase or you didn't do any pre-planted decisions. You just have like, six uh, parallel options somehow. Uh, and in a way, you would like to do this multiple comparison of everything. That is kind of, a, kind of, you'd like to look at all the possible results. Well, okay, then let's do it. Let's do all the 66. But let us, for the God's sake, remember that that's what we did. So we designed a new procedure that helps us not to make the, pr the mistake that I was uh, talking about before. And the procedure is to make us more critical in how to uh, call something an important difference or a significant difference. There are several such procedures in software and in theory. The one we present here is not necessarily considered to be the best of all, but it's so nicely simple. And it gives a nice uh, way of thinking about this challenge in many contexts. So I'm happy to share this with you, even though it's not considered the best method for all things. 
The idea comes here. We call it a Bonferroni correction due to some guy who came up with this many years ago. The thing is, when I'm doing 66 comparisons, the capital M here, the individual comparisons should not, or the individual confidence intervals should not be used on 5% level each. I am going to be much more critical. I'm going to use 5% divided by 66 level. Much more critical. The T percentile becomes much larger, right? So it needs a larger difference, observed difference, to be called significant. When I, I become more critical. In that way, I, as it said, control the overall type 1 risk, the alpha, uh, by doing this. The, the problem of this procedure is that sometimes it may just control a little bit too much, actually. It's a bit conservative there. So, um, but that's then, in a way, maybe may better than the opposite, right? So, uh, and at least it's a bit more cautious than the other thing. The difficult part is to know whether you can allow yourself to consider yourself to be in this position for a certain comparison. It's an easy mistake to do if you really want to show something significant. And I assure you there are many scientific investigations where at the end of the day we are searching for significant results to have something to report, right? And then if you find yourself in that position, it's easy maybe to, to start thinking, uh, I think as far as I remember, I did plan to compare number one with number seven. I'm sure, I'm sure that was my plan. Yeah, didn't we discuss that this last? Yes, we did, yes, we did. Ah, yeah, so we did. Okay, I found a significant result now out of those 200 ones I investigated, right? Um, don't do that, of course. And if you are an intelligent business manager, of course, you don't want to base your investments in the future on such decisions, obviously. It's pretty obvious to everyone with a bit of brain activity. Um, we can do confidence intervals or we can do hypothesis tests on this post hoc investigation, right? Post hoc, again, I repeat, means comparing specific groups with each other after having done the overall F-test and found that something is there to report, right? So we could carry out a T-test, a two-sample T-test. This is very much like the pooled two-sample T-test, as I already told you. The one would be that we didn't use as default, we used the unpooled, the Welsh version. But this is the, a version of the pooled T-test to repeat, just like the confidence interval, where the variance in the, the variance we use, we use is this that comes from all the groups. And then we can find the p-value. And again, either we do the single pre-planned test and then we just use the 5% level as it comes, or we use this Bonferroni correction of the overall. Let me, um, let me as finalize this post hoc thing, uh, the first part of it at least, and then hopefully we'll have the time to do a bit more at the end. Um, I wanted to share with you just this, we are back in uh, this uh, panel check software that we have made for, for the industry and that, that they use, where we do have actually each of those. Now, in this case, we have not only one attribute, not only the noise, I actually measured a lot of different attributes. So we do this analysis of variance many times, actually, here. Not only one time, but many times. And then we have uh, set up such a nice, uh, for instance, here's the noise. We have made this little... Uh, Thing that compares the products. Here I have product TV combination, um, let me see, difficult to identify, number three, which was uh, this one, number three, has the highest noise level, the number eight had the lowest noise level, right? Are they statistically different? Yes. And number eight, this is the comparison here, 
we have put it into such a bar to say how large should how large should the difference be between two means for them to be called significantly different? That's in the so-called LSD bar, least significant difference bar. You can read about that in the notes also. And look at what we've done. We have also told people, look at the bars. You see that? Uh, these were the Bonferroni bars. We actually not only tell you about that, we also shared with Bang & Olufsen that uh, please, if you just want to do this overall comparison of all your product, please use this one and not the other one. The first one is for pre-planned comparison. The second one is for this overall looking for something, right? Look at the bars, how large the bars changed. They're now the bigger bar is the one you should use to call something significant, but still, look at the noise here. The noise is the third of those attributes. Still, I mean, no doubt about significance here. No doubt that product number eight is the, the one with the lowest noise level. It's even significantly lower than anyone else, even than the nine that seem to be pretty good also, right? Um, so uh, that's how to, uh, um, to use this stuff in this case. Two more things. I've, I have a, after the model control, I have a, we're going to look at an example in the, in, the, in the notes. I hope I have five, ten minutes to, to do that with you. I do it a bit different than usually. I didn't prepare the slides, but I'm going to look at the example from the e-note just to take you through how we would do an analysis of variance once again. Just summary, summary of what we've learned during this lecture. However, model control.